The Flywheel Explorer LR pretty much defined the four inch long range lightweight category. But just because it was first doesn't mean it was the best. This is the Gep RC Baby Crocodile, and it is Gep RC's entry into that same category. And today we're going to ask the question, which is best? No, actually we're not. Because there's also the iFlight Chimera 4 inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Gep RC Baby Crocodile, and we're going to kind of act like these other two guys don't exist and just review this quad on its own merits because that's what I did for the Flywood Explorer. And we'll do the same thing in a third video for the iFlight. And then we'll do a fourth video after I've really dug into them all where I will tell you which one I think is gonna be the best one for you. But today we are looking at the Gep RC Baby Crocodile. I'm Joshua Bardwell and you're gonna learn something today. When you first get your baby crocodile, one of the things you're gonna have to do is install this antenna. Uh, the antenna comes loose just so it'll fit in the box and you're gonna just jam it down in this 3D printed part on the back, which also holds the GPS uh, receiver. The 3D printed piece also has these holders here for antenna tubes. If you're using a 2.4 gigahertz receiver, like a, like a FreeSky receiver or FlySky or whatever, kind of defeats the point of having like a long range quad, if you're going with a regular 2.4 gig, you would definitely want to use this with either Crossfire, FreeSky R9, or the DJI controller itself, which is how I've got it set up. The quad does come with these antenna tubes, which you can insert here, and then the antenna feeds down into them, and it has caps as well for the end of the antenna tubes. In general, I hate these antenna tubes. They seem like such a good idea because your antenna will just stay safely out of the props. But actually what happens is the first time you crash, they just break or well, it didn't break as much as I thought it would, but I just find they don't stand up to crash as well. However, since this is not really an acro basher, maybe you're not gonna crash as much and maybe they'll work a little better. Definitely is a good idea to get the antennas up higher above the quad, especially for longer range flying. And if you were gonna be using Crossfire, it comes with this 3D printed piece, which goes on the back which holds the Crossfire Immortal T. The quad comes with this battery pad, which it's always nice, but um, I prefer a little bit of a grippier and thicker battery pad. So I would usually use a gel pad like this Umagrip, um, which I think is gonna do a better job of retaining the battery and just make sure that the battery doesn't dig into these screw heads. That being said, again, because this is not like an ultra bando basher, the chances of you ejecting a battery in a crash are lower. On the other hand, if you do lose your battery and you're kilometers out, you're done. So maybe it's more important that you have a grippy battery pad that's gonna ensure that the battery doesn't eject. This stuff is not bad, but it's not as grippy as like a gel, like I'm a grip. Speaking of losing your quad kilometers out, it does come with a self-powered buzzer, which mounts here underneath the GPS. The point of this thing is if you crash and if you eject your battery, the self-powered buzzer has its own little tiny one cell LiPo that'll let it keep beeping for a while uh, so you can find it, like in the trees or in the bushes or whatever. Um, it's not the biggest self-powered buzzer that I've ever seen. And let's see how loud it is real quick. Hmm. It's reasonably loud. To disarm it, you can push this button right here. Usually they have you hold the button down for two seconds. On this one, apparently you just do a, a light touch. Why would you, I don't know. Anyway, there you go. I love the fact that the frame has space for two battery straps. I'm of the opinion that two battery straps are more than twice as strong as one. The reason for that is that if you have a single battery strap in a crash, the battery will kind of try to lever out and it'll pull the battery strap against the frame edges and maybe cut or break the battery strap. If you have two battery straps, one in the front, one in the rear, the battery cannot sort of lever against either of the battery straps and they're less likely to break. Also worth pointing out that the edges of this frame have been uh, rounded off. 
some frames don't come that way and the sharper edge of the carbon will cut the battery strap. Um, they'll be more likely to cut it if you don't round it off with a file, which most people don't. So kudos to Gepparcy for that. Gepparcy always seems to have a really high quality of carbon and really a lot of sort of fit and finish put into their frame designs. This is no exception. Although a capacitor is not strictly needed for all 4S builds, and especially when using the digital system like the Cadex Vista, a uh, capacitor doesn't really make a big difference in how clean the video is, GEPRC have included a capacitor here, and you can see that they have covered the legs of the capacitor with heat shrink, which is, uh, I think it's a really essential step to keep the capacitor from short-circuiting against something accidentally. Um, a lot of people skip that step, though. Now, as you can see, I've got the Cadex Vista version of this build, and GEPRC have done something really interesting uh, with how they've mounted the Vista. And this is going to be a little bit of a controversial decision. So they have mounted the Vista not as part of the flight control stack. Here's the flight controller. We'll talk about that in a second. And here's the Vista. The Vista is mounted to the top plate. Mounting the Vista to the top plate means that if you do have to work on the quad, then you remove the top plate and the Vista comes away and the flight controller is 100% accessible. It also means that there's not this great big weight at the top of the flight control stack, which could some maybe affect the vibrations of the quad. I try not to have too much weight above the flight controller on the flight control stack. On the other hand, it does mean that the height of the quad is way more than it might otherwise need to be. Why didn't they put the Vista back here like so many other designers would have done and give you a little bit more of a slam deck design. Does it matter? If you're not doing ultra acro flippy floppies, which is kind of not the point of this quad, does the fact that it's got a little bit of a higher CG matter? I don't know, but something about it kind of rubs me wrong. You've got all this empty space I guess if you were gonna build this for yourself, I would be saying, oh, it's great that you've got this empty space because it gives you the flexibility to stick additional stuff in here to use a different flight controller, a different VTX. And if you are looking for a DIY build, maybe this would be a better quad. But when I'm looking at a ready to fly, I want to see a little bit more optimization and it seems like that optimization isn't quite here. One other thing about taking the top plate off, in order to take the top plate off, you're going to remove one, two, three, four, five, six screws. It's a little bit annoying that this piece goes on top of the top plate. You can see that these screws will come out, no problem, and then the top plate will kind of slide out here. I'm not sure why this piece doesn't attach underneath the top plate here to the standoff. The other thing that you get, and this is not going to be much of an issue with a quad this small and light, but the other thing you get is that these screws can't be as tight as they would because they're compressing the TPU. And if you compress them too much, they'll just dig down in and cut through it. Um, again, on a bigger quad with more vibration, this might be more of an issue. Uh, it's probably not going to be an issue, but I kind of don't see why they didn't just put that there. The top plate would come off easier and these screws would be more secure. They probably have a reason that I'm overlooking. So let's take the top plate off and take a look at the insides. And I'm only going to be able to go so far here without pulling on the camera. They have taken up the slack in the camera wire with just a little bit of heat shrink and they've just made a little S bend. That's a nice touch uh, just to kind of keep it, keep it out of trouble from getting snagged or whatever. Yeah, boy, between the antenna wire and the camera wire, I just can't really get in here so easily. Does it go the other way? The flight controller is a GEPRC true all-in-one. That means it's got both the ESCs, these are the little FETs for the ESCs, and the flight controller all on one board. This is not a flight controller and ESC stack. And the spacing of the mounting holes might surprise you too. These are not 30 millimeter or 20 millimeter mounting holes. This is a 25 millimeter spacing. If we look on the underside, you can see it a little better. That 25 millimeter spacing originally comes from Tiny Whoops, I believe, and is currently being used for toothpick flight controllers. That's what this flight controller was originally designed for, but it'll work fine for this weight and motor of quad as well. If we look on the underside, we can see that there is both 25 millimeter mounting holes for these all-in-one flight controllers, and if you were to build one of these on your own, there are holes for the 20 millimeter stack, but obviously if you're buying the ready to fly, that's not gonna be a concern.
The arms are held in on the top with this retaining plate, and this is something we've seen in other GetRC builds. There is a little tab here for mounting like a receiver or something else. Again, if you're building your own. Screws come down from the top into press nuts here on the bottom. These are pre-installed in the bottom plate, and the arms are changeable if they break, and the quad does come with a couple of spare arms. It comes with two spare arms. There they are. The quad does come with a couple of spare arms if you were to break one. But GetRC have done something a little... I can't decide if I love this or I hate it. So most people, when they design a frame, they would put the camera behind the front standoffs and they would use the carbon fiber frame itself to protect the camera. GetRC have mounted the camera ahead of the front standoffs and then are using these TPU bumpers and this TPU uh, lens guard to protect it. Like, it probably is going to protect it just as well as anything else. But it's a little bit, I just kind of would feel better if it was behind carbon fiber. The camera does have adjustable up tilt. It's just held in with friction. There's no second set of mounting holes or anything to hold it in place. And you're just going to set the up tilt that you want and leave it there. And it can go from perfectly flat to, oh, it can go, oh, it can go all the way up there. You're not probably not going to do that on this build, but you basically have as much up tilt as you want. The carbon on the frame is 1.5 millimeter for the top plate, 2 millimeter for the bottom plate, and 2.5 millimeter for the arms. And I feel like for a quadcopter like this, where lightweight and long flight time are the goal, as opposed to crashability, those are fine choices. The motors are made by GEPRC, and they are, not surprisingly, 1404 in size and 2750 in KV. This is a little bit lower KV than the Dave C motors on the Flywheel Explorer, uh, but the 1404 size is pretty much the go-to for this category. And everybody, here's how things go. Somebody develops a new category like this one or like the Acrobrat or whatever, and, or a toothpick. And then a whole bunch of other people basically just build the exact same thing. And then people start trying different things. So we're still in the everybody's just copying Dave C's design and they're using 1404 motors pretty much the same as he did. As far as weight goes, the dry weight of the Cadex Vista version comes in at about 152 grams. So that gives you just under 100 grams for your battery, assuming you're not carrying anything else like a naked GoPro or whatnot. This means that it's going to be very easy to get it under 250 grams uh, for those who care about that and get good long flight times, especially if you're using like a high volt battery. Um, that you, no problem. If you decide that you want to carry a naked GoPro, it's going to come up to about 183 grams. That includes the GoPro holder. Uh, and you're still going to have a fair amount of room to get your battery in there. Although you're getting squeezed a little bit now, it's going to be pretty hard to come in under 250 grams with a naked GoPro. The big question is, what about this thick boy? This is the 3000 milliamp hour 4S lithium ion pack that GEPRC, I can't figure out if they include it or if they sell it separately. Mine came with the uh, baby croc and I've seen other reviewers reporting the same thing. If they do include this, this is a fair value. Um, this brings the weight up to 353 grams. It's a honker there. It is definitely not going to be the most acrobatic, but this is the one that is theoretically going to give you those 30 or 40 minute flight times. We'll see about that. As far as suggested batteries go, this would be my choice for the lightest possible build. This is a 520 milliamp hour 4S high volt battery. You're always going to get more milliamp hours out of high volts. You're just going to get, they're just going to last not as long. That brings you to 206 grams. And can we? Yes, we are still under 250 grams, even with the naked GoPro. Now I've flown these guys in a parallel configuration to get closer to a thousand milliamp hours. That does put us over 250, but not by much. Another battery you could consider, this is a Zylo. Now this, you wouldn't want this exact battery because this has an XT60, not an XT30, but I just grabbed it and it's an 850 4S, puts us at 253 grams. A similar 850 battery with a different uh, set of wires and an XT30 would definitely keep us under, uh, under 250 grams. In a minute, we're going to go outside and fly this guy. But before we do that, let's take a look inside the Betaflight configurator and see if there are any surprises that uh, GetRC have left that you need to be aware of before you fly. Um, this is normally the part of the video where I might do a full setup tutorial. But 
the setup for a lot of these quads, especially the DJI quads, is more or less the same. So instead, I'm going to link you to a couple other tutorials that I've done. Uh, they're not for this exact quad, but they'll work for you uh, and to show you how to get it set up. Um, there, it's going to be linked down in the video description. Let's just focus on what makes what's unique about this particular quad. And we'll start here in the ports tab where we can see that just like the Flywoo Explorer, GEPRC doesn't have enough UARTs on this flight controller to run all of the functions that they need to run. So they've got UART 1 with the MSP configuration for the on-screen display in the DJI goggles. If you have the analog version, then you wouldn't have this on UART 1. Uh, they've got UART 2 for the serial receiver, and they are using soft serial. Uh, and the problem with soft serial is that for higher bandwidth, higher speed connections, soft serial in Betaflight 4.2 has a bug and it just stops working randomly. And on the Flywheel Explorer, that means that your on-screen display will sometimes lock up or even disappear while you're flying. Flywoo's fix for that is just to go back to Betaflight 4.1, but who wants to do that? You want to be on the latest and greatest, right? GEPRC have done something clever. GEPRC have put the on-screen display on a hardware UART and they've put GPS on a soft serial. And I guess the theory is that GPS is running at a slower speed so soft serial can keep up. Or are we gonna find out that GPS just drops out randomly? I don't know, we have to fly it to find out, but I hope that this is gonna mean that we won't have any issues. We're saying it would be better if they just had enough hardware UARTs for all the functions, but mm. I guess that's not an option with this flight controller. Here in Betaflight's configuration tab, one thing I notice is that bidirectional D-Shot is not activated. This means that we cannot be running RPM filtering, which you could argue that for a long distance cruiser, it's not that big of a deal anyway. On the other hand, you could also argue that it's the kind of thing that you always wanna have, if at all possible, it can't hurt and it can only help. The main reason that they're probably not doing this is that they're using BL Heli S ESCs and BL Heli S ESCs don't support bidirectional D-Shot by default, except that they do if you flash the right firmware to it and they just haven't. Maybe that's because they didn't think it was worth it or maybe it was just a hassle. It'd be nice to see this feature. Here in the power and battery tab, I'm gonna suggest you raise the maximum cell voltage from 4.3 to 4.4 if you intend to use high volt batteries. And I do suggest, especially if you're concerned with the 250 gram weight limit, that you're gonna be using high volt batteries, you'll get just a little bit more milliamp hour per gram out of them. But if you don't change that maximum cell voltage, Betaflight will mistakenly read your fully charged high volt 4S as a discharged 5S and be yelling at you low voltage the whole time. So we're gonna change that to 4.4. And down here at the bottom, we'll just hit save. Here in the failsafe tab, we can see that they do have GPS rescue set as the failsafe method. And that means that if uh, you lose connection to your controller, then the quadcopter will attempt to use the GPS to fly home. This is a good thing if you're doing long range cruising. If you were using the quadcopter under, like under tree cover, it would be a bad thing because it would try to ascend and fly right into the tree. So if you ever are flying indoors in a parking garage or, uh, under tree cover, you might want to go into beta flight and turn the fail safe from GPS rescue to drop. By the way, there is no way to do that like with an aux switch. The only way to turn GPS rescue fail safe off is to go into the configurator and turn it off. Or I suppose you could just like pop the GPS plug out and so the GPS wasn't working. I guess that would work, but there's no easy way to turn that on and off, unfortunately. Would like to point out my preference for GPS rescue is to allow arming without fix. And what that'll do is that'll let you take off even if you don't have the minimum number of satellites. If I'm just gonna do like a light acro flight or a test hover, I don't wanna have to sit there and wait for the satellites to lock before I do that. If you take off without the sufficient number of satellites locked, then GPS rescue will not work so that it's now on you to check that you have the minimum of six satellites locked before you fly. If you're not comfortable with that, leave this option off and Betaflight will not let you fly until you have the satellites locked. The other thing I like to change is the sanity checks. I put the sanity checks on fail safe only. And what this does is if I trigger GPS rescue by flipping the aux mode, then let's say the quadcopter doesn't have a good GPS lock and it just starts flying to the moon, trying to climb to 5,000 feet or something. 
well, I'll just flip that off. It won't protect me from that. I'll just flip the aux switch off and say, oh, I guess it didn't work out well. It will still do sanity checks if you fail safe because then you're not in control anymore. Hmm? This, If you change this option, basically, you just have to be prepared to flip the switch back if you activate GPS rescue and anything bad happens. The safest thing is to leave sanity checks on. It's on you if you turn that off. Here in the PID tuning tab, I can see that GetRC has customized the rate profile. This is actually kind of cool. Most of these quads are delivered with the Betaflight default rates, and then it's up to you to put your custom rates on it. But what if you're a beginner and you don't know what your custom rates might be? The default Betaflight rates are actually not that great. And these actually, I kind of, these are actually closer to the rates I normally fly. And I kind of like that GetRC have done this. Here in the modes tab, they've given you an arm mode, an angle mode, horizon mode, GPS rescue mode and a beeper mode. This is pretty slick and it might even correspond to the default layout of the switch on the DJI controller. That's actually really nice. Uh, if you need to set these modes up yourself, I've got a tutorial about how to do that. I'll put it in the video description. I'm not going to put it right here because it's pretty much the same for all for all quads like this. I'm also pretty pleased with the layout of the on-screen display that GEPRC have given us. A lot of these quads uh, in this category just put a bunch of stuff on the screen in a, not a very organized way. This layout looks really good. It would work even for the analog quad, but I can also see that it'll look good uh, the same layout on the DJI goggles. By the way, if you need to know how to get the custom OSD to appear on your DJI goggles, this won't show up by default unless you go in your DJI goggles, you go into the display menu and enable the option show custom OSD. You need to turn that on in order to see this stuff if you've got the DJI version. Now let's take a look at how this guy flies. And for the record, I am flying it with an 850 milliamp hour 4S pack. Um, that is the, well, to be honest with you, I didn't look up the suggested size for the GEP RC, but that's the suggested size for the iFlight Chimera. And I've got this pack right here ready to go. So that's just what we're gonna go with. Um, worth pointing out that you can fly these guys with much heavier or much lighter batteries to significantly change the flight characteristics and the flight time. I've flown this with a 520 milliamp hour 4S high volt. And even though it had the 3000 kV motors on it, it was pretty fast and poppy. I've flown it with a 3000 milliamp hour 4S lithium ion. It was super heavy, but it got like 30-ish. I don't know exactly. I, I got bored and didn't finish flying it. It could fly forever. So we're gonna fly it with this one, the nominal sort of setup. And uh, yeah, let's do it. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is 256 grams with that 850 milliamp hour 4S on it. Just barely. You could probably get it under 250 if you tried. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of freestyle speedy stuff. I know that's not what these quads are designed to do, but especially because one of the quads we will be comparing this to is the iFlight Chimera, which is available with a 3700 kV motors. We see how these 3000 kV motors perform. And especially with this 850 milliamp hour battery on, you could definitely tell they're the lower KV. Um, I did a flight before this with a 520 milliamp hour 4S high volt. Uh, and that lighter battery I thought was super poppy and fun and I still got three or four minutes of flight time. Uh, that won't necessarily make this quad durable enough that you would want to freestyle it on a daily basis, but you certainly could make up the difference in the motor KV with a lighter weight battery. But with this 850 milliamp hour pack, it is just not intended for sort of freestyle rippage. It's intended for longer range cruising. So let's do some of that. And we should get just a great amount of flight time. I am using these Axie HD goggles. Uh, so I'm getting a little bit of extended range out in this direction compared to behind me. I can see I'm at one freaking one bar. Oh my gosh. One bar on the controller. I am using the DJI controller. Let's raise that up a little bit. Two bars on the controller. Yeah, you can really tell that the freaking uh, video signal has better range than the controller. We're about to find out if GPS rescue works. Lol. Let's not do that. Just love coming up and flying on this ridge. Oh, I can feel the wind. I can feel the wind here pushing against me. We'll have to check the DVR to see how stable 
the squad is in the wind. Looks okay from here, but a lot of times you'll see something in post that you didn't see. Oh boy. 25 million, why am I, oh, there you go. A lot of times you'll see something in post that you didn't see while you were uh, flying. I don't know if there's something about this antenna or what, but it seems like I have a little worse range. Make sure I'm at the maximum possible output power. Seems like I'm at a little, having a little worse range than I usually do. I always turn off temperature protection on all Cadex Vistas. Uh, as long as you get the quad in the air reasonably soon after plugging in, you'll be fine. And temperature protection can cause the Vista to perform worse even in flight is my experience. Oh yeah, that's, I would expect that to be a little better than that. Let's see if, make sure we're on the max. I think I checked that, but let's just double check. Let's just bring this guy in real quick. Maybe the antenna's something, something to do with it? I don't know. Let's do some more flying. It's getting a little windy. I love flying in between trees like this. You can feel so much more confident with DJI that you are, are gonna be not 100% guaranteed, but more likely to catch one of those annoying scraggle branches or something that would get you with a little more reaction time. That's one of the points that I've made in the past is that it, the latency of the DJI system is not as good as the latency of the absolute best analog systems, although, Many analog systems have comparable latency. However, oh boy. However, the ability to see where you're going that much further in advance can make up some of that difference, which is, I think, a thing that a lot of people overlook. They just see the latency number and then they stop there. So that brings us to the end of the video. And as always, the question, should you buy it? And I'm gonna go over what I see as the pros and cons of this quad, and maybe that'll make the difference for you. But the truth is, I'm not ready to fully answer that question until I look at all the quads in this category and do that shootout video that will be coming as soon as possible. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it. This quad is up against the Flywoo Explorer, the original that defined this category, well, based on the original that defined this category, the uh, iFlight Chimera 4-inch, and the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker, and that's some hefty competition. But for now, what are the pros and cons of this quad? Uh, the build is probably a little more roomy and spacious than it really needs to be. I'm gonna guess that they're using this exact same frame on the analog version, which comes with a split style camera and a dual lens uh, analog slash HD camera. Um, does that affect the flight characteristics though? I thought it flew pretty well. I love that it comes with this lost model buzzer. I really feel like this is essential on, well, on kind of on all quads, any quad that you don't wanna lose, but especially on a longer range quad where it might go down far away. GPS performance was great on some of these quads. Maybe it's the way they run the wires or maybe it's the actual GPS unit that they use, but like the Flywheel Explorer specifically took a long time to get GPS lock and never seemed to have as many satellites locked as they thought it ought to. Uh, GPS performance on the Baby Croc was uh, excellent. I was kind of disappointed in the range in the Baby Croc. And I say that having done a bunch of this flying of these exact same quads in this like little one to two week period. So I feel like I have a pretty good sense of how far I should be able to go and how many bars of RSSI I should have. And the Croc seemed to underperform. The only thing I can, because obviously it's using a Vista, right? Vista is Vista. Uh, the only thing I can think is that it might be related to this antenna. That's just the only uncontrolled variable here, but maybe I just got unlucky on that one. All that being said, the Baby Crocodile comes in at a price of about $310 if you're using the DJI controller, or you can add a Free Sky or a Crossfire controller for between $15 and $25. Uh, if that is something that seems like a good deal to you, there are links in the video description and you can pick it up using those links. Those are affiliate links. I get a small commission anytime you make any purchase 
after clicking one of those links, just click the store's affiliate link, go do your shopping, check out, and it helps support the channel and it doesn't cost you anything. It's a really easy thing to do. On the other hand, if you want to wait and see the full shootout that is coming as I will not keep you waiting. I will get it done as soon as I can and get it published. Check out the other videos in this series. My review of the Flywheel Explorer HD strongly suggest you check out that one because it kind of describes and defines and discusses this whole category in a way that I didn't do in this video. Um, Flywheel Explorer HD, iFlight Camera 4 and the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker We'll have videos to those, and I will link them in the video description as they come out. That's going to do it for this one, though. Thanks for watching. Happy flying. You guys, I don't know where I am, and I, I don't know what's going to happen, but if I don't make it out of this, I just want to know that you subscribe to my channel, or, or maybe join my Patreon, or, or click one of the... Click one of these videos I picked out for you! <laughs>